Grace and peace to you in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Good morning and welcome to Centenary United Methodist Church and Happy New Year. Today is not only the first Sunday of the new year, it is the first Sunday of our sermon series, I Believe. We'll be walking through the Apostles' Creed and kind of breaking it down to see what we really mean when we say these things that we believe each week. And now let me tell you what's going on at Centenary. Our Logos program will resume for the new semester on Wednesday, January the 12th at 4.30. The youth group will resume their Sunday evening meetings on January the 16th at 5.30. We're looking forward to a great new semester in our children's and youth ministries and, and looking forward to all the activities that we have to come. And now let us prepare our hearts for worship. Good morning. It's a blessing to be worshiping with you today at Lawton Centenary United Methodist Church. We're here at Centenary this morning. If you're watching online, we've had some really bad weather, and a brave few have made it out to the late services this morning. Uh, to those of you who are on campus this morning, I'd love to say to you that your next two weeks of sins are forgiven. I'd love to say that, but I'm not allowed to say that. However, if you think it, that's between you and God, so you, you all can work that part out. It is a joy to be worshiping with you both on campus and online, thankful on days like this that we have the online option. Uh, also, wanted to uh, just reiterate what Pastor John said in the announcements today. We begin a new series. It's based on the Apostles' Creed, and it's called I Believe. And uh, to be honest with you, there's a strategy in the way we're doing this. Uh, it will lead up to the beginning of confirmation when our young people go through a process where they learn all about the faith, uh, learn really what the core beliefs of Christianity are, and have the opportunity and the invitation to profess their faith. And it just seemed like a good thing for the whole congregation to sort of be involved in that process as we begin a new year. So we'll all be looking at the Apostles' Creed together. I also want to mention to you, in case you didn't grow up Methodist or are watching online and not a, have not been a part of this tradition. On the first Sunday of the year, traditionally Methodists do at least some part of John Wesley's covenant service. It's a way of rededicating ourselves to Jesus Christ for the year that's coming. And so this morning we'll be taking a part of that service, the covenant prayer, and we'll be praying that together. And again, that's just a way to, at the very beginning of the year, to say that I'm placing Jesus Christ first in my life, and in my servanthood, and in my heart. We invite you to join us this day as we worship. Good morning. Please join me with a call to worship.
Let us join together in worshiping God. Join me in the words of this promise found in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 20 through 22. He has anointed us, set his seal of ownership on us, and put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. Amen. The hymn of praise is I Sing the Almighty Power of God, number 152 in your hymnal. Spread the blowing seas abroad and fill the lofty skies. I sing the wisdom that ordained the sun to rule the day. The moon shines full at God's commands and all the stars obey. I sing. I got the power. <laughs> before we do that, before we say this, all I have one thing to say, and that is go dogs. <laughs> it is the tradition for Methodists to begin the first service of the year, rededicating their lives to Christ. We join tens of thousands all over the world praying this prayer to our Savior together today. I am no longer my own, but thine. Put me to what thou wilt, rank me with whom thou wilt. Put me to doing, put me to suffering. Let me be employed by thee, or laid aside for thee, exalted for thee, or brought low for thee. Let me be full, let me be empty. Let me have all things, let me have nothing. I freely and heartily yield all things to thy pleasure and disposal. And now, O glorious and blessed God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, thou art mine and I am thine. So be it. And the covenant which I have made on earth, let it be ratified in heaven. Amen.
Let us pray. Almighty God, we confess to you that we are the servants, not of you, but of worry. We worry about this virus. We worry about whether we should take a shot or not, and if we decide to take shots, how many should we take? We worry that whatever we do, we'll still catch this illness, or someone we love will catch it and suffer. We worry, oh God, about inflation as it seems to be skyrocketing. And the simple things we buy in the store, like chicken and tomatoes, cost much more today than they did not long ago. We worry, oh God, about the violence in the world. We see violence in our streets. We know the world to be a violent place. We worry, O oh Lord, about the continuing prejudices that separate us. How, despite all that we've been through as a people, we continue to be divided over gender, over the color of our skin, over our religion, and over a thousand more things. We worry, O oh God, that we do too much, and we worry, O oh God, that we do too little. We worry, O oh God, that we don't spend enough time with you, and we worry, O oh God, that somehow we even forget you. Let us, in this new year, lay those worries aside, bury them in the grave of the past, cover them with dirt, and take them away from us forever. Take away the feelings of not being good enough, smart enough, safe enough, then replace them with an incredible hope that no matter what we face in this new year, you, our God, will be with us. You'll be there standing with us in the grocery store line. You'll be there with us at work and at school. You'll be there with us when we fear we're ill. We worry and pray for a loved one. Fill us with hope, O oh God, that we'll experience your presence in an incredible and powerful way in this new year. And help us to find one change in this hour of worship that we can make in our lives that will be a blessing to you, God, first, and then to those around us. Open our ears and our hearts that we might hear you and know you. Trusting that Christ walks with us, we pray the prayer that he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day daily bread, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Not into temptation, but deliver us from evil power, and the glory forever. Amen. <coughs>
Transform them into light for the hungry, for the hopeless, for the forgotten, and the oppressed. We will share his light in us. In Christ we pray. Amen.
Today's scripture comes from the book of Genesis. Then God said, let us make humankind in our image according to our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle and over all the wild animals of the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. God said, See, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree with seed and its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished in all their multitude. And on the seventh day, God finished the work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all the work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it, because on it God rested from all the work that he had done in creation. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Do you ever get into conversations you wish you had never started? It usually happens to pastors when someone who doesn't know us finds out we're a pastor. Uh, I know that when I go on trips, I don't exactly share that information. When I end up on an airline, for years I did this, my wife owned a business, and technically my name was on uh, the charter of the business as an owner. And I'd get on the plane and someone would say, you know, what do you do? And I'd say, well, we own a gift shop which technically was true, right? But I was working full-time as a pastor. And, and you just, you know, you, there are just certain conversations you don't want to get into. And I got into one recently with a guy who found out I was a pastor and started to talk to me about his church versus our church. Those are always joyful conversations, aren't they? Those are always fun. Maybe you had one of those around the holiday. You know, my religion versus your religion, my church versus your church, that kind of thing. Uh, and it was just not going great. You know, he, he was saying things like, you know, in our church, he said, we only do, you know, the ancient, original stuff of the church. And I know his church very well. I grew up in his church. So I, I said, are, are you sure about that? Oh, yeah. We're not like you Methodists. Get up there on Sunday morning and read a bunch of dead creeds and, and things that, that people wrote. We're, we're in the original stuff. And I said, let me ask you this. Do you like the hymn, Blessed Assurance? And he said, that's my favorite hymn. I said, it's in your hymn book, right? Yeah, that's in my hymn book. It's a hymn book we use every Sunday. And I said, Blessed Assurance by, by Fanny Cosby, right? Yeah, oh, yeah. He said, we got a lot of hymns by her. I said, yeah, I know your hymn book. You have a lot of hymns. About half of your hymns are by Fanny, who was a Methodist girl, by the way. Thank you for your patronage. We appreciate it so much. You know, we'll send you a bill at some point. The publishing house will, anyway, right? So she wrote Blessed Assurance in the late 1800s. I've looked it up since. It was 1873 when she wrote that. And I said, so she wrote that in the late 1800s. That's as ancient as your church music goes, right? And he was kind of silent. And I said, you know, in our church, we sing something that goes back six, 7,000 years every Sunday. Every Sunday in worship, right? You sing the Gloria, folks. You may sort of, you know, look by it, pass it by, but it's really important. Because the Gloria is a tune and is a concept, technically it's what we call a doxology. It's when the whole congregation says, amen. It's like a cheer. It's like when you're cheering for your favorite team, like the Pokes winning yesterday. Phew, that was a big deal for some of you. And when you had your big cheer, that's a doxology. It's a big cheer. We say we're all in agreement and celebrating this. So, so the Gloria, glory be to God, you know, we sang just a few moments ago. It goes all the way back to the temple worship time. So when Jesus went to the temple to worship, 
he sang a form of the Gloria that we sing and worship every Sunday. Now, in the early church, they got into this debate when nasty, oh, mean, everybody hiss, Arius. Hiss. I'm waiting for your hiss. Hiss, right? We've talked about this. When Arius comes along and says, Jesus is really not God, right? And we know what happens next. Beautiful, wonderful Saint Nick, Saint Nicholas, I don't know if he's wearing the costume we associate him with, comes up and slaps Arius, literally. And as the story goes, Saint Nicholas gets tossed into jail for that. You're not allowed to slap fellow clergy persons, even when they're ridiculous. That is really a shame, in my opinion. But we still have the same rule today. You know, you get in trouble. So the, the early church took the Gloria that they had been singing as Jews in temple worship. They bring it into the early church, and they change the words around a little bit to reinforce for everyone that Jesus is God. So it's Trinitarian. We sing the Gloria in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, right? So we're singing a tune that goes back to the time, past even before Jesus, in worship. With, two, with, with words that come from the origins of Christianity themselves. He wasn't very happy with me for that. I got to be honest, the guy I was having a debate with, I said, look, I'm, I'm going to help you out here. He said, tell me where you get you know, the words that you use in worship. He said, we get them from the Bible. I said, okay, now you understand that the Bible was put together after the stories happened, right? They didn't get the New Testament, and then Paul goes, oh, this is what I'm supposed to do today. I'm glad I've got this Bible that somebody got me from Walmart. I can tell what I'm supposed to do this week, right? The stories were happening, and then it gets written down later. And he sort of had to concede that. I said, which Bible do you use? And I knew what was coming. He said, the King James. And I said, I hope that's the authorized version, number one, because that's very important if you're a King James person, that you read the authorized version. There are those, some that are not. And I said, I assume you're reading the original 1611 publication, which I knew he wasn't. Nobody in the U.S. publishes that version anymore. But, but anyway, that's the original King James version of 1611. It's a Bible that was put together for political purposes. When King James put it together, he gave orders to the translators to soften all the stuff in the scripture about kings. You know, that's why you, you get sort of this odd story about Pharaoh and the hardening of his heart and all that. It just doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. Is because King James was dictating that. He also was dictating that he didn't want anything to show up in that translation that reflected the beliefs of the Puritans. So they got, got all that stuff. So it's a very politically oriented translation. It's a good translation, but there's a lot of politics involved in it, as there is with every English translation. I said, so that's, that's your formation for worship is something that was written and published in 1611, which is, you know, almost four, it's 400 years ago. That's pretty good. We do something in church that goes back 2,000 years. Every Sunday we say the Apostles' Creed, because that's one of those old creeds you all just make up and say, wrote, and nobody believes in it. And I said, well, I hope we believe in it. <laughs> I couldn't dispute his feelings too much, because sometimes we do just say it without thinking about it, Right? But it goes back 2,000 years. The story is, and this is a story, all right, told by ancient Christians. It's not scriptural fact, but it's a story, but it's an interesting story. Is that each apostle, the apostles gathered up after Jesus ascended into heaven. They had Matthias, who was the replacement for Judas. Judas was not allowed at the meeting, wasn't alive, but if he had been, wouldn't have been allowed at this meeting. And that they put this creed together. Each apostle added their part. And Peter spoke the first lines, the lines we'll be looking at today. That's the story. So there are 12 different sections of the Apostles' Creed, and the story goes that each apostle, apostle contributed one section at the time of the ascension of Christ into heaven. That's the story. Now, what we do know as factual in history is that in the early church, right, there's no Bible yet. It hasn't been collected and put together. There's letters out there floating around, letters from Paul, the Gospels and things, but it has not all been brought together. So in that early church, people mostly converting from Judaism, where did they find their faith? How did they determine what Christianity meant? They had an order. They had this thing called a creed, credo in Latin, I believe, right? It's extremely important to understand that when you say the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, etc. You're saying an I believe statement. This is what I believe. I believe it so deeply that I order my life around it and I will live it out every day of my life. That's what you're saying when you say the creed, right? So they had this creed that was something like the Apostles' Creed, very close to it, that people would say 
at baptism. That was the heart of baptism. You would say that creed as a way of saying, These are the, this is why I'm becoming baptized. This is why I'm becoming a Christian. This is why I'm leaving the Roman gods behind or the Greek gods behind or the gods of Egypt behind because I believe these things. And then they would be baptized. right? And that goes back to the origins of the church. So every Sunday when you come in, you are speaking those words from the very origins of Christianity itself that predate the New Testament. It's the summation of what Christians believe to be the heart of our faith. And we reinforce that in lots of different ways. In this, instant, this morning, for instance, when, when Peyton and Teague came up to the front as acolytes and they lit the two candles on the altar, those are there, one for the humanity and one for the divinity of Christ, joined together at the altar, joined together which goes back and refutes the argument of Arius that Jesus wasn't divine. Well, Nicholas had to slap him down. I love St. Nick for that ever since then. All right? The early church formed those creeds because they were particularly interested in helping us know what it was to be a Christian. What's, what's different about being a Christian? And also to deal with those kinds of debates. You know, is Jesus truly God? One of the first big debates. And so in the creeds, they form that out and they set it out for us to know and learn and understand. Again, 2,000 years old, predates the, predates the New Testament, not the Old Testament, the New Testament. And is the first formal statement about what it means to believe, what to believe as a follower of Jesus Christ. The New Testament is formed, that creed continues to live on. And we have it today and we say it in worship today. I have to say, the guy I was having the debate with really did not appreciate my history lesson. I was not particularly sur surprised because often in my family, my own family members don't appreciate my history lessons. So that was not too surprising, right? What he said next was very important, and he asked the right question, what do you believe then, right? And that's what we're going to be talking about over the next few weeks. What do we as Christians believe? And today we start with the text in Genesis, Genesis, the story, the first story of creation in Genesis. The first words I learned when I learned Hebrew were Bereshet bara Elohim. In the beginning, God created. And that's exactly what the Apostles' Creed picks up in its very beginning. Right? Bereshet bara Elohim picks up this argument that God is the creator. Now, right there, of course, you get into all kinds of controversy because we start to get into these controversies in, in, in our state politics and education and everything about how creation happens, right? And I tend to look at it as though the Bible has a different reason for talking about things than science does. They're not incompatible. There are places where they intersect, but there are places where they don't, and they speak about things in different ways. For example, if you get a chance this year you get a chance these next few days as you start your new year find the article on the Hubble telescope there's a thing out there floating around that shows you all of the pictures of space that the Hubble telescope took this year all of the pictures particularly of the stars they're so magnificent you look at that and you think it's not real somebody on Star Trek studio made that up that's real that's a picture from the Hubble satellite of the stars it's amazing and incredible to me right but I also saw an image that I love very, very much recently, and it was by Van Gogh. It's a painting by Van Gogh called Starry Night, right? Beautiful, amazing. If I owned that, you would never see me. I would just probably sit in the room where I had it on the wall and stare at it all day long, right? So they're both, port you know, they're both images of the same thing, of Starry Night. They're both images of the same thing. But they have very different purposes. They were formed in very different ways, and they convey very different meaning, right? The picture from the Hubble telescope tells us some, something about how the, the, the cosmos is set in place. And it, it was, it's done in order for, to have scientific research about that. Van Gogh's Starry Night is completely different. That's about a feeling. That's to elicit a, a human response from the heart. I think the Hubble pictures do that too, but that was specifically what Van Gogh did. To me, both are real and both are true, but both serve different purposes. So I think the old debate between science versus religion is, is sort of an old straw dog and not really worth engaging in anymore. I think we're past that. 
So you look at that creation story and what it says about God and ask, why is it there, right? Bereshit, para, Elohim. You begin to look at that language. The, la- the, the word Elohim is, is a word for God. And it's really, really important in this. In this. When we're, we have the Apostles' Creed and those early Christians saying, okay, you're about to get baptized, you need to believe in God, right? We're going to say that in our creed. It, here's the word God, the very first time it's mentioned in Scripture. And it is a generic word for God, right? It's a, it's a general word. It's the word that you can say in Hebrew and not offend anyone. Hebrew, devout Jews don't casually throw around God's name or the words for God in the Bible, in their Bible, the Torah and the Old Testament, what we call the Old Testament. They don't throw that around casually. When our Jewish friends write to us and they want to say something about God, and they always do, you know, just God bless you, something like that, they'll write G, star, star, exclamation, or something like that, right? Because they will not even write the name of God. They think that defiles the name of God. God is so holy. First time they did that, I thought they were saying something nasty. You know, it took me a minute to get, get my head back into the culture and understand what was being done there, right? But Elohim, anybody can say. That's a generic, everyday word. But it's really powerful in this context because what you notice in the use of that word is that this is not the God of the Jews. This is not the God of the Christians. This is not the the God of the Catholics or the Orthodox or the Baptists or the Presbyterians. Oh, and I hate to say it, not even the God of the Methodists, right? This is God of all. This is the God. And, and what is it that God does? How does how, what information do we have in the beginning? Genesis means origins. So in the origin story of everything, as Douglas Adams would say, great British author, look it up later, you'll be glad you did it. He's funny, he's a really funny guy, Douglas Adams. So, so it's the beginning of everything, right? And what is God's function in that? Because this is a story not to prove anything scientifically or to disprove anything scientifically, but to show how things in creation function and how they're related together. And that's extremely important to understand, how they are related. In fact, now, if you read the text carefully, if you read the text carefully, you know, we as Christians, we talk about creatio in nihilo, is is the, the Latin, you know, made from nothing. But if you read the text, that's not exactly what it says. It says the earth was, was, was without form. So something is there. And God begins to move across it. And this is extremely important to understand. Because this affects who you are as a human being. And the way you live in the world. And, and who, what your identity is. As a person created by God in the womb. The cells that divided to make you, God divided to make you. For this reason. Bara, the word we we translate as created, is a word that's used 50 times in the Old Testament. And every time it has, a, it has a direct object. It's not creating just to create. It's not creating in the sense that an, necessarily that an artist creates. It means to bring the purpose out of. It means to take something and give it its meaning and its life. It means to take something, and and, and, and for instance, you think of a seed planted in the ground. When you see the seed, you think there's not much there. It's dead. It looks like something that's dead. And you put it in the ground, and you carefully tend it, and you water it, and you keep good soil around it, and you protect it from all the things that might attack it so that it will develop and fulfill its purpose and become an apple tree. That's what the word bara in Hebrew means. So what God is doing is he is giving purpose to everything we know in creation. In fact, it says in the creed, he created heaven and earth. That's sort of a a, a colloquialism in Hebrew. Sometimes we translate that very literally and we say, well, he created the earth, he created the heaven, and certainly that's true. And that's what the people who wrote the creeds believed. But there's more to it than that. It's also... Uh, a, a colloquialism in Hebrew, and I'll give you an example. Suppose, hypothetically, my wife always asked me to do something. And just suppose, hypothetically, not real, but just hypothetically, okay, that I never remembered to do it. 
okay? And so suppose just hypothetically, out of, she's already laughing at me. She's already, she's already mocking me. So hypothetically, right, she says to me, I've told you to do that, I've told you a billion times, right? Hypothetically, of course, right? Hypothetically. Okay, she has not counted every time I have failed to do it and come up with the number one billion. One billion just means so many times you can't even count them. It's the same colloquialism in the creation story when it says that God creates heaven and earth. It's the way of saying God created everything. God created it all. God gave it all life and purpose. Now that's powerful stuff, right? I mean, I love the Hubble te telescope, and I can look at those pictures all day. But this, this is many steps above that. Right? This helps me know who I am as a human being, what I was put on earth to do, why God breathed air into my lungs. Right? Because God had a purpose for me, and God is raising me up to fulfill and live out that purpose. God created me for something, to be a certain person and to do special things in the world. Now, we can argue whether, about whether God gives you those very specific things or gives you some general gifts and tools to go out and do things. So we can debate that, right? But, but this part is undebatable in Scripture, that God has created you and formed you for a purpose. That's the beginning of it all. And it describes a God who in, whose natural character is to give life and to give purpose. God even goes so far as to name things, you know? Why name things? I mean, if you're God, you just throw them out there. Why do you care what their names are, right? And yet there's this whole thing about naming. And, and at each point that God creates, God looks at it and calls it good, which in Hebrew, the word we translate for good is a word that says right. It's right. It's just right. You know that moment? I know as a musician, you know, you, we can play a piece and make a thousand mistakes in it, but the effect is just right. Sometimes you say something to someone that you've longed to say to them for a long time, and you may not say it perfectly or the way you imagine it in your mind, but the way it comes out in that particular moment, it's just right. So God says over and over as this creation is happening that it's right. It's good. It's the way it should be. This is something that is filled with, and here's the important word, potential. To look at everything in creation is to see things created by God filled with potential. To look at every human being is to see people around us who are created for purpose, who are filled with potential. The potential to be amazing. Every person, every child. So to look at them as anything less, to me at least, is sinful. That, that's my opinion. To see someone as less than is to denigrate the work of God. So to stay mad at somebody or angry or to hold a grudge is me denying the work of God. That in that person there is the potential to be extraordinary. And at some point, that potential may and should be realized. And it's my purpose and part of my potential to help them fulfill that in their life. That's why we teach classes at church. That's why we have children's programs and youth programs to help them know they have a purpose and how to fulfill the purpose they have in their life. Now, now, God does this really amazing thing. So God's going through all of this, right? And, and he's creating, and he's creating, and, and he does it in a very powerful way. He does it in a special way, according to the text. He uses what we call the logos, which is later language, but, but it means the word, right? So everything comes into creation by God's spoken word. Now, that was a very powerful concept in the ancient world. When the king spoke something then it was done, right? 
everybody agreed that it must be done. And so this is the God, Elohim, and he is bara, creating by speaking things into existence and purpose and life. That's why we, every Wednesday night we have a big program called Logos, right? The Word. It's about helping people understand who they are and why God created them, younger people especially. Right? And that's how God does it. And then God does this really crazy, weird thing that everybody has debated. He gets to this point. And here the, the, the pronouns are all masculine, so later not, later not, but here masculine. And, and God gets to this weird point where he starts talking about creating human beings. And he said, let us create them in our likeness. And there's a huge debate about who the them is, right? So if you ask the writers of the early creed, like the Apostles' Creed, they're going to tell you, and it's reflected in the creed, that, that is the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit that's having this discussion. Of course, in Judaism, they don't have the Trinity. And later, Jew Jewish scholars are saying this very interesting thing, that God is actually having this discussion with the animals. So it, 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 it's kind of interesting because it, it, whichever way you believe leads you to a different conclusion, right? If you're an early you know, medieval person, for example, and you believe, believe that you're literally created in the image of God, you believe that God looks like you physically in some way. Right? If you take the Jewish approach, and God is discussing this with the animals, then what, what God is talking about is that we are created in life. That that's how we're similar to God. That we're created to live, and to live in relationship. Because this whole story is about relationship. How God relates to the birds, and the fish, and the mountains, and the trees, and the stars, and the sun, and the moon. How God speaks, and the water divides, and the land is formed. How God speaks and we come into existence. And you can debate who the we is with whom God discusses that, but you can't debate the fact that God speaks and we come into existence. And then God does the craziest thing. He sits back in the recliner and takes a break. Now, my mother explained that to me once a long time ago, and she was a very conservative Christian. But she said, what she thought was, because she had given birth to two children, she said, after you give birth, you got to rest. You've got to kick back and recover. So that was her take on it, right? But we don't always like that idea of a God who has to rest. You know, God is worn out from this creation thing. That kind of puts limits on God that we don't like. Well, the ancients would have heard this in a very different way. For them, all of this story is temple language. This is the language that was used in ancient stories in the Near East and Middle East to describe how temples were created. And temples are the only place that a God can rest. And so this God comes to rest in God's temple. And that temple is all of creation. Now, the reason I think that that's probably is because by the time we get to the book of Revelation, right, which describes how things will be in heaven, God in Christ is seated on the throne and all of creation, dogs and kittens and puppies and mice and scorpions, everything, comes and worships God. The dog you loved, the kitten you loved, the scorpion you didn't, all gathered there worshiping God, all of creation, it says. So what, God, what has been described in these opening passages of Genesis is the creation of a temple for the God. And that temple is all of creation itself. Spoken into being by God. Barak created by God for purpose. Purpose to live in relationship with God. Purpose to serve God. Purpose to worship God. Purpose to be present with God. Purpose to live with God both now and later. Purpose to be the object of God's love and so that we might love God. In the beginning, God created, which the creed writers take up. I believe 
and God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I want to conclude by telling you a story I told you the first year I came here. It's one of my favorite stories. We were in Hebrew class, like 350 students. You had to major in a language when I went to seminary. And out of 350 students, about, you know, 342 of them were were Greek, (laughs) right? We're studying Greek. There were eight of us studying Hebrew, right? So we thought we were pretty cool, pretty elite. And we're studying Hebrew, and we're studying this creation story. And those, I told you the first words that I learned to translate, in the beginning God created, right? Right? Bereshit, bara, Elohim. That's the first thing I learned. And so we're studying that, and we're going, and one of the students says to our teacher, who was an Episcopalian priest, says to him, man, it's too bad lay people can't do this. They'll never really understand this story. And, and my, my teacher got very quiet. And he said, okay, he said, tomorrow we're going on a field trip. I need everybody to be here at this time, have good walking shoes. We're going to go a little walk, have a field trip. So we're anticipating he's going to take us to some holy shrine or or maybe to a a synagogue to read from the real Torah, something like that, because we're brilliant scholars and theologians who are in our second semester of seminary. And uh, he gathers us up the next day, and he walks us down about half a block and across the street. We're still very disappointed we went to a church. I mean, we, we, you know, it's not exactly Indiana Jones and, and the, the Holy Grail or anything, right? We go to a church, and he takes us to the school. The church has a school. It's filled with little kids. And he goes to the first grade class there in that school, Christian school at a church. And, and all the first graders, you know, gather in a circle around him. They know him, obviously. And, and he asks them. He tells them this story, right, about God creating. And then he asks the children what does the story mean? And every little hand goes up, whether they paid any attention to the story or not. They just all want to say something, right? And so he's a smart guy. He knows who to ask. He, he knows which, you know, which kids would go to Sunday school. And he asks this one little girl, okay, what does the story mean? And she says, the story means God loves us. And he turned around and looked at us, students, brilliant scholars that we were, and we were silent. And he looked at her again. He said, why would you say that? And she said, because God doesn't want us to be alone. This is the word of God in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I'd invite you to stand now, and we will join together in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Remain standing. When the little girl said God didn't want us to be alone, our professor turned to us and said, can any of you improve on her answer? And we were silent, right? Because that's the truth. God loves you. God doesn't want you to be alone. God longs to have a relationship with you. We invite you to take a step today in having a relationship with God, to come and be baptized and make a profession of faith if you've never done that in your life to come and join the church. God called us together to live in community. From the beginning, God was relationship and relational. And we invite you to come with any needs you have that we might pray for you. God already loves you. Give that love back now. Will you come as we stand and sing? Oh, brother, so-
It's been a blessing to worship with you today, both on campus and online. We are so glad that you're with us. Uh, watch that weather and be safe out there. We want all of you to have a great new year. And uh, again, so grateful to be worshiping with you. I want to say something before the sending forth, and you can repeat it to me. And uh, we'll say it loud enough that all the people watching online can hear. Are you ready? You trust me that much? Give it a shot. We'll see, right? Happy New Year! Happy New Year! Amen. Now let's say the sending forth. Simon was an old, Simeon was an old man when, he, when the newborn Jesus was brought to the temple for the first time. Simeon recognized who Jesus was and lifted up the baby, proclaiming the words, words like we now share. Loving God, now your servants may go in peace, just as your word has promised, for our own eyes have seen your salvation made ready with everyone looking on, a revealing light for all and a glory for all your faithful people. Amen. Let's go. As thou depart in thy peace, blessed Jesus, send us to our homes with God's love in our hearts. Let the Thank you.